Yeah, no problem. I think we straightened out all the technical problems. So allow me to start this wonderful uh, event. I'm Marina Galvani, the head of the art program at the World Bank, and I welcome everybody to this uh, September event of We Are Africa, the Power of Women and Youth. For those who have not participated in our talks before, we have monthly events in which we introduce artists who are part of the exhibition in dialogue with other development experts to discuss different topics that affect the continent. Today, we will focus mostly on a new narrative of Africa. And our moderator is the wonderful Muzopa Kalenga, who is a 2019 winner of the World Bank competition for young bloggers. So I'd like to pass the mic to Kalenga and I look forward to enjoy this day with you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Marina. So I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us uh, from today. A uh, very warm welcome once again to our event, Culture, Tourism, and the New Narrative on the Continent. And as uh, introduced by Marina, my name is Mr. Pakalenga. I am the World Bank Block for Dev 2019 winner from Zambia, and I will be your moderator today. And today, we are, we are joined by incredible panelists. And I now take this opportunity just to introduce our, our wonderful panelists. Thank you so much for making the time to be with us today. Uh, on the panel today, we have Ali. Ali Jate is um, a Zanzibar-based professional tour guide who creates and shares video stories of Zanzibar. Among his notable accomplishments, Ali was selected to elaborate content for a uh, European Union-funded uh, project on cultural heritage, serving as a lead supporter among other international heritage experts in collection of information. Another speaker today is Kim, Kim Karabo Makin, who was born in 1994, a young multimedia artist from Botswana. She's a graduate at the Michaelis uh, School of Fine Arts, University of Cape Town in South Africa, and is currently a Master of Fine Arts student um, there. McKean's work is based on research into her family and other historical archives. That includes uh, sculpture, sound, and installation. She combines techniques and patterns of Botswana's distinctive craft uh, traditions with new materials, such as fancy holes and hair, to imbue her works with new meaning, questioning ideas of gender, race, and national identity. We are also joined uh, by uh, Victoria um, Timonova, who is a member of the World Bank Art Program team. She has a background in sustainable um, destination and management. And of course, uh, Marina, who is a senior program manager at the World Bank uh, Art Program. And lastly, definitely not the least, uh, is Moki. Moki Makura was born in Nigeria, educated in England, and has lived in London, Johannesburg, and Lagos. She is the executive director of Africa No Filter, a donor collaborative focused on shifting the African narrative. Prior to that, she was a Deputy Director for Communications at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where she was responsible for producing and managing the foundation's reputation on the continent. In 20, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm losing sound. Hello, can, can you hear me? We can hear you, but yeah. maybe a little yeah. louder. Okay. Can you increase the volume? Musopa, okay. okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you better. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so prior to uh, that, she was a deputy. I'm talking about uh, Moki. So prior to um, joining um, uh, Africa No Filter, she was a deputy director for Communications Africa at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where she was responsible for building and managing the foundation's reputation on the continent. In 2017, she, was an in, she took an interim role at the foundation's country representative to South Africa, responsible for government relations and internal program coordination. Before joining the Gates uh, Foundation, Moki worked as a communications director for the Tony Ilumelo Foundation in Nigeria. And prior to that, she was a well-known TV presenter, producer, author, publisher, and a successful entrepreneur in her own right. Um, Moki holds an honors degree in politics, economics, and law from Buckingham University in the UK. 
as part of a passion to present a positive image of Africa and showcase its heroes and achievements, she created one of the first websites to serve as, as a re, 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 sorry, repository of uh, positive facts about the continent. I'm very happy to share this website with you in the chat box, but it's www.africaourafrica.com. And uh, Moki started and runs the first uh, storytelling networking event for women called Her Story Jawbreak. And also, um, she serves as a, she serves on advisory boards on three nonprofits, including um, Junior Achievement and the Hot Bay Partnership. Moki was recently appointed to the board of Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, those are our wonderful speakers, and I now take this opportunity to go back to uh, Marina to, to give us our opening remarks. Uh, Marina, please, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Musopa, for this wonderful introduction. So allow me to give you a little bit of background of this um, event. So um, as you see from the title, this event is dedicated to cultural tourism and a new narrative. You may wonder why we are talking about tourism now when this sector has come essentially to a still stand globally. The reason we are um, addressing this from the angle of tourism is because tourism not only is an incredible job creator, is um, accounted for 30% of the world, 30% of the world um, international export. And for Africa, between the 2000-2014, counted for 8.1% of the GDP of the continent. But tourism is motivated uh, by the image we have of a place. And specifically, when we talk about cultural tourism, we are motivated by the culture and the contemporary and the heritage of a country, or in this case, of a continent. So today, um, I think we are facing um, an incredible opportunity to forge a new narrative for the continent. So I would like to bring you a little bit, if I may go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, through the art collection on the World Bank, and some artworks are part of this exhibition. So in 2008, the World Bank started the first uh, exhibition dedicated to uh, multiple countries on the African continent, more specifically 32 countries, and uh, in an attempt to challenge the stereotypical images of Africa. You can see from these uh, two artworks, on your left, you have, if you want a more traditional image of Africa, the street seller, very simple, uh, naive painting, generally for uh, um, if you want a tourist uh, market. On the right, you have a very sophisticated rendering on the same subject by Cedric Nzero, who was uh, one participant of a panel um, two months ago on uh, rural women in Africa. You can see he is a fashion designer and photographer, but you see um, the completely different take onto the subject. We are not portraying something, if you want, in a sort of your own uh, painting, but um, emphasizing a negative image of Africa. But we are presenting women work in a rural setting as gorgeous uh, top models. So exactly this is the intent that several of these artists are sharing about presenting a new narrative, a new image of Africa. If we may go to the next one kindly, to the next slide. Thank you. Similarly, here, you have a um, thing that has to do with work. Again, on the side, on the left side, you have uh, a scene from a marketplace. Uh, again, a traditional rendering. On the right side, with this wonderful artist from Karun, part of the permanent collection, is the same topic. It has to do with work. Specifically, this gentleman is unpaid doing his work. But you can see the um, irony and the reference to pop culture used by uh, by the artist. Um, so, if we can go to uh, the next one, kindly. Yes, and again here, you will uh, maybe be able to listen to the video. We have a participant of 2008 art exhibition, um, Wanaina from Kenya, a writer who writes about how to write about Africa, a very ironic piece about all the topos, all the stereotypes about Africa. One of them is presenting warriors um, in a, if you want, in a very um, sleek and slender uh, shape. On the other side, you have this art artist, Longinos from Kenya, who is uh, making a 
a very, if you want, uh, um, intelligent and um, whimsical rendering about consumerism, more specifically presenting a sense of the Louis. Sorry, I have my three years old participating as well. Um, as a Louis Vuitton uh, saint. Can you go to the last one? Not yet, not yet. And I would like to close with these two wonderful artworks. The one on the right by Lolo Veleko was the cover of our 2008 exhibition, Africa Now. Africa Now was the first of our regional exhibition in which we were really trying to present uh, Africa through a new light. This is clearly at least a uh, uh, 12 um, years old artwork, but it's a very intelligent artwork that is treating the, the subject of, of race um, in, a, in, a, in a new way. On the left is again an artwork in much more contemporary, has been just acquired from Cameron, and you can see again a traditional subject rendered with a very contemporary take. So what I would like for you to take away from this very short uh, excursion through the permanent collection of the World Bank is that even within the collection, we form a narrative. The kind of artworks we are presenting influence the way people see a country or see uh, a culture. So, and we wanted to support the artists who are trying to create a, a new storytelling about the continent. I'd like to pass now the baton to my colleague, Victoria Timonova, who is an expert in, uh, in cultural heritage and sustainable tourism. Victoria. Thank you, Thank you Marina. Um, culture includes tangible, intangible, and contemporary heritage, uh, which are reflected in traditions, languages, monuments, music, handicrafts, and uh, art around the world and uh, is of immeasurable inherent value to its community of origin and also it gives uh, the people of a nation and region a sense of identity, community, pride and belonging. At the same time, culture is a key tourism asset, uh, inspiring millions of tourists uh, to visit destinations uh, each year. Uh, tourism uh, nowadays is no longer limited to sun and beach. Uh, modern day travelers are not just looking for seeing something, but looking for local, immersive, uh, authentic, interactive uh, experiences, cultural experiences. Tangible heritage is usually better known and better as uh, it is better promoted, uh, while intangible heritage may help tourists have uh, specific experience, but um, need uh, knowledge and skills from visitors to understand and enjoy them. Interpretation becomes a key issue uh, as cultural tourism develops uh, in that direction. Place interpretation is not uh, an attraction or experience as such, rather it is the art of communicating the destination sense of place to prospective visitors and those who are already in market. Uh, place interpretation is important to the cultural tourism market because uh, it highlights the destination's cultural themes, uh, connects the destination's past and present, its achievers and achievements, its vision and visionaries using narratives and stories, reveals the destination's place attributes and heritage intangibles. So interpretation can be a means of uh, linking heritage and culture to place uh, as a way of developing a holistic experience for the visitor by connecting different elements through narrative and storytelling. Definitely, uh, there are strong uh, interlinks between tourism and culture and if sustainably managed tourism can be a considerable force uh, for promoting and safeguarding of tangible, tangible and contemporary heritage uh, it relies on, while encouraging the development of arts, crafts, and other creative activities, which can be enjoyed by both tourists and local communities, present the key to preserve the cultural identity of territories and for a more effective sustainable development. The bottom line, when tourism is sustainable, cultural and natural resources environmental, social, and economic well-being are kept in, a, in an area and uh, will be kept in an area indefinitely. Marina, back to you. Thank you so much, Victoria. And so, um, as you can see, it has many advantages to promote sustainable tourism, but at the moment we can't have it. But we can have this fantastic opportunity to, to have artists helping us reshape the story that we want to tell to tourists, local and international. 
So I would like to pass the again the mic to Musopa and uh, the panelists. Thank you all. Thank you, Marina and Victoria, for um, those wonderful remarks on uh, elaborating the power of um, tourism, art, and culture in reflecting local culture and um, sustaining um, development. So thank you so much. I'd now like to take this opportunity to invite Kim, who is going to share on how artists like herself are creating works that seek to generate a new narrative of the continent and what cliches are being uh, debunked. Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mustafa, and thank you for that introduction, Marina and Victoria. Um, for, again, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kim Karabomekin, and I am an artist from Botswana that is currently based in Cape Town, South Africa, where we're actually celebrating Heritage Day today. So happy Heritage Day to all of you. And I think um, it couldn't be a more appropriate day for us to have a conversation like this. Um, on the topic of how artists are creating work that seek to generate a new narrative of the continent, with respect to my own individual practice, I am particularly interested in unpacking my identity as racialized, cultural, national, uh, personal, but also relatable. And um, so I'm particularly interested in how I identify myself versus how I am identified by others. And with that, I have most recently begun to unpack the sub-Saharan philosophy of I am because we are. Um, otherwise known in Sutwana as Boto or Ubuntu in Zulu. And um, with that, I start to unpack the sort of push and pull of uh, individual versus collective identity. With the image that we see on the screen, it's actually a work of mine that is currently in progress for my master's project. Um, it is currently entitled Molenza and refers to a particular basket pattern from Botswana which is called Urine Trail of the Bull. And uh, with this work, I'm particularly interested in unpacking the cultural value of the Botswana basket as a symbolic mediation of our identity. Um, Botswana is highly acclaimed internationally for our distinct basketry. And so the that I employed in creating the map that you see on the screen method that is similar to that used in Botswana's uh, craft, uh, well-known craft of baskets. Um, instead, what I do here is I introduce a new language uh, to the coiling method of Botswana's baskets, and I instead translate this symbolic mediation of my identity culturally and nationally into a language um, of racialized material, that of nude pantyhose and synthetic hair fiber. Um, with that, I was aiming to unpack my identity with a particular focus on my multiculturalism, um, introducing, where the material introduced a new flexibility to the otherwise rigid uh, basket form, uh, with particular uh, detail to, the, to my context in South Africa. And so with that, I began expanding on my personal sense of identity as a Mozana from this location. Uh, that being in South Africa. Um, in that sense, I have been interested in unpacking the manner in which uh, migration and movement informs my sense of identity uh, differently, or rather informs our sense of identity on the continent differently. Um, with the particular image that we see on the screen now, I was referencing um, a bag that some of you may know uh, as a China bag. Um, it's normally made from a plastic mesh material that is uh, in blue, white, red, and sometimes black. Um, Check like nature transient and transnationality, in that it is normally associated with a group of uh, immigrants in a particular country. So, going back to the case of Botswana, we popularly know it as a Zimbabwe bag, as it is often associated with Zimbabwe, Zimbabwean immigrants in Botswana. Um, with this particular bag, I am interested, or I was interested in unpacking um, Africa as 
denying a settled destination, as is said for um, the rest of the Global South. And so I... Um, began to unpack the status in South Africa and racialism in respect to the South African historical context. Um, and so again, I have this push and pull of individual versus collective identity where um, through the racialized material, I began using these object symbols, considering object identity and the social life of things on the continent and thinking about how I identify myself versus how I relate with others. Um, this is something I continue to explore uh, currently with my master's project where I'm taking a look at transnational identity and historical entanglement with a particular focus on the transnational space that exists between Ghana and South Africa. Um, I suppose this is what introduces my slight contention with the focus on tourism in that um, it is aimed at tourists not to negate the local significance of um, a dialogue on new narratives of the continent. Um, th this is something that I've explored um, through my collective practice with the Bugana Pavilion. Uh, the image you see now is an installation image of our very first uh, installation of the Bugana Pavilion, which we had here in Cape Town. Um, it was a small group of Bugana students studying in Cape Town that got together um, as we so we shared a commonality in the way that our work often referenced an aspect of home. And so we began to unpack through art our subjective realities as Bagana um, with a look at how we related to home or our sense of home from dislocation. Um, with that, our name, the Bagana um, Pavilion, references the Art World Olympics or um, uh, for example, the Venice Biennale, where um, the territorialized notion of art is emphasized um, through national pavilions that present their country's art or the, you know, the creme de la creme. And um, instead, um, as the Botswana Pavilion, we're interested in debunking this sort of cliche and instead emphasizing a sense of borderlessness in thinking about the cultural value of our sense of home and how that travels across borders within and beyond the continent. And so with the next slide, uh, we took the Botswana Pavilion home um, in an exhibition that we exhibited at the Botswana National Gallery, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, and this for us started to continue the conversation where we unpacked our sense of identity via dislocation and then relocated that into our context at home. Um, with that, we're particularly interested in, like I said, a, a sense of transnationality um, and diasporic trajectories, but also most recently with our upcoming projects, which we've titled Collective Ties, are particularly interested in nurturing our identity on the continent as fluid and multiple. And so, um, through a new narrative of the continent, we are particularly interested in embracing creative and cultural exchange in the region. Um, thank you so much, Kim. Sorry to just jump in. Um, um, let's get back to you and we'll learn def I would definitely learn more. And thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. We will definitely talk more about this um, in the panel discussion. And um, uh, may I now take this opportunity to um, just introduce Ali. And uh, Ali is going to share with us how he started creating his video series and his experience as a professional tour guide uh, operator in Zanzibar. Ali, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Musopa, for uh, for uh, joining me uh, in. And uh, I, uh, as introduced, uh, my name is Ali, and uh, I. Um, I, I am based in Zanzibar working as a professional tour guide and uh, making videos actually uh, since the start of the pandemic. But uh, I would like to uh, to start with, with a video, actually. That, that, uh, can you, on the next uh, slide, I guess. So 
Sopa? Um, yes, Ali, I'm sure um, Juliana. Okay. Or oh, Sarah, is it Sarah? I Juliana, I think. Yeah. yeah. I think can, you, uh, can you yeah. see the video? Yeah. Okay. Welcome back. And in this video, I am going to share with you the five things that you probably did not know about Zanzibar. Without wasting any more time, let's get going. Before we get to the five things, here is something I would like to understand. It is a common misconception that Zanzibar is considered as just a single island. In fact, it is a series of small little islands and two one of them being Pemba Island and the other one known as Puja, which is also referred informally as Zanzibar. I don't want to keep you waiting. Let's get directly to the point. Yeah. So uh so 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 the reason the reason I wanted to to the reason I wanted to start with that piece of video is uh, to actually uh, show my journey at the start of making the videos and uh, to clear up a misconception of uh, what people speak of uh, Zanzibar in terms uh, of what it is. But uh, the reason I started making the videos is uh, making a uh, feeling that people who came to Zanzibar and with the start of the pandemic, people still care about the destination. And actually they don't care about, let's say the beach they went to, but they care about the people and the experience they've, uh, they've had into, uh, into coming to Zanzibar. And uh, that made me feel like, okay, we are here and uh, Zanzibar was closed as a destination around the end of March. And who is here to share the information to the people? Looking at the local media, all uh, most of the media is uh, like putting up news and things like that, but mainly in uh, in the local language. And as an advantage with me speaking English, working with uh, with these people from different parts of the world, and uh, you think this is something uh, something interesting because we are here and no one can come and uh, tell our story. We need to tell the story of what it is and what it feels like being here during this time. And that is when I uh, actually uh, started making the videos to share what it is for us with the world. So with the people that have been to Zanzibar before, but also with ed anyone else out there who wanted to understand about how it looks like, how the situation looks like during, uh, during the pandemic. And I think that's uh, very important in the sense that because most of the times when you look online, you see all this content created by uh, people, but when you search, you don't see like local people from here who actually are creating the content. And uh, changing that narrative is, uh, is something that I was also looking into because, uh, and that's why my focus was mainly into using and creating content in, uh, in English language. And uh, it doesn't mean that speaking my own language would, uh, would, uh, would, uh, would not be okay, but it's because that uh, speaking my local language would not be able to make me reach that uh, uh, global audience of people uh, understanding of uh, the story we have, and therefore the introduction video that I uh, have uh, I've shared with you, it's uh, also to uh, to was clearing up a mixed conception of what people think of Zanzibar as just a single island, but it's a collection of all uh, the small little islands that are here as well. But uh, again, explaining the things that people didn't know about the place, because often people come and they don't experience the place as a the way it is in terms of its uniqueness. And um, I'll give a clear example of that. Um, in Zanzibar, Stone Town is, uh, is its World Heritage Site. And most people come and visit, and I had guests before as part experience, and they ask you, what is the reason and what makes this place a World Heritage Site? Like, we don't see anything important here. We just see buildings, we just go around, we see people living, but what makes it a World Heritage Site? And being able to share that not only with people in a, in a way that you explain it to them, but also in a way that uh, you can create something out of it as a video, which uh, people can come back and have a look. We want to go and experience this place, but what should we look into to maximize our experience and to understand more of what this place is, uh, is all about? And that became uh, something very important to me in terms of creating the videos as well. And um, 
in the same in the same part is also understanding that there is a lot of things that are happening but um and uh, a lot of talent a lot of things that people are doing but these things are not seen by people and therefore i uh, i also made a video to showcase uh the talented uh, people and uh, people who do things like um, gymnastics and acrobatics and stuff like that to uh, express of, uh, of that these talents are here. But uh, on a normal perspective, when you visit, you don't really see these kind of things. But uh, on a local perspective, going to certain places, we see of things like that. And that was something important also to, uh, to, uh, to express. And I think through videos is uh, where we can get that part of uh, expressing it through to the, uh, to the global audience. Um, thank you so much, Ali, for that uh, beautiful presentation. And I'm sure after the video, um, everyone yeah. here would like uh, love to visit Zanzibar. And um, yeah, Ali has a YouTube channel, and you can subscribe and watch more of his uh, wonderful videos. And now I would like to introduce uh, Moki, who's going to um, share with us how to empower next generation of African um, storytellers. Moki, please. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for um, for inviting me to do this. So I'm going to try and be as quick as I can because I'd love to get to the panel. But if this was more interactive, uh, one question I'd love to ask is when you think of Africa, what are the words that come to mind? And let me actually be more specific. When you think of Somalia, Zimbabwe, the DRC, Mali, Mauritania, Angola, South Sudan, Nigeria, what are the words spring to mind. Because we don't have all day, I'm just going to tell you some of the ones that are more popular. A lot of people think about poverty when they think about Africa and some of those countries. They think about corruption. They think about conflict. They think about disease. They think about poor leadership and dictators. We change. And all of those stories which often come up about Africa is how often Africa is framed. It's this Afro-pessimistic view that this is who we are. And it's not to say we're not. And this is the point that I'm always careful to make. Africa is some of these things. There are areas in the continent that are poor. There are areas in the continent where corruption happens. There is still some conflict. It's only, I think, five or six countries are in conflict on the continent now. But it's become the single story of Africa. And I think perhaps the worst framing of Africa of all is that Africa is a country. Because if there's Ebola in DRC, people don't come to Africa. And I've heard people say that. You know, when there was HIV in largely in South Africa at the time, people were scared of coming to the continent. But there's a flip side to this Afro-pessimistic, you know, to these words, the poverty, the corruption. You know, wealth. If you think about the opposite of poverty, it's wealth. If you think about the opposite of corruption, it's integrity. If you think about the opposite of conflict, it's peace. Opposite of disease is health. Opposite of poor leadership is good leadership. We have all of these things on this continent. It's just that this is not necessarily what we're known for. Let's um, go to the next slide. You know, everybody talks about narratives. And the important thing is that Narratives, and I put the description here because I think just to explain that narratives are a collection of stories that are articulated and refined and told over and over again, and they represent a central idea or belief. And those stories that we, I've just mentioned about poverty, of corruption, of conflict, of disease, those stories ladder up to those harmful stereotypical narratives about Africa that we well, certainly African officials is working to change. And it's that Africa lacks agency, that we can't do things on our own, that Africa is dependent, and that Africa is broken. And the, the reality is that these narratives are not the only narrative of Africa. There are others. So in a way, I, I disagree with the starting premise that we want to write a new narrative, or we want to create new narratives. The narratives, the positive narratives are already there. They are just not top of mind, and people just don't think about them. So let, let's um, swap to the next slide. 
And the reality is we can sit back and we can say, well, you know, that's just the way it is. And we know that we are not all that. But I think that the important thing is that we know the way to change people's perceptions and change people's opinions about things. It's through something that we as Africans have, and we have in droves, we have a lot of it, and we've seen some examples of it. It's our creativity. You know, I use this quote, which um, I have to read it here. It, art is uniquely positioned to move people. It inspires them, inciting new questions and provoking curiosity or outrage. That's exactly what we want to do to challenge those existing existing narratives. Because creativity is the rawest and the most honest form of expression. Um, and creativity comes with it from within. So we don't need anybody. We don't need anything to trigger creativity. So for me, the reason why African Ophelta focuses, focuses on art and artists, and by artists, we don't just mean visual artists, it's content creators, filmmakers, and we also already know the power of, um, yeah, let's stay on that side for a while. I'll, we also know the power of pop culture, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. So we, let's go to the next slide. So one of the important things is the Africa story, and we talked about the story of Africa and the story we'd like, and we talk about negative stories and positive stories. But why should we be telling our story? The reason why we feel it's very important that we tell our story is that young people, particularly on this continent, are beginning to believe in those harmful stereotypical narratives. Most, a lot of Africans have an American dream. They don't have an African dream. Migration on this continent is higher than it should be. I've heard young people say that, yeah, they need to get to America, they need to get to Britain, or they need to get to France, because that's when it's going to happen to them. They don't believe that innovation, creativity, jobs, all of these things are available on the continent. And that's because they believe in an alternative narrative about the continent. When is the time to tell our story? The time to tell our story was back then, but it's now. And I use this when because even during COVID, the way Africa, Africa, the African story around COVID has been told, it's still as if we have the highest infection rates, we have the highest death rates, and actually on the contrary, Africa has come out of a, ahead of the US, of other countries, even other developing countries, India. But yet Africa is still the one that everyone's like, oh, if COVID you know, gets to Africa, we're all going to die because it's, you know, it's just going to spread uncontrollably. It hasn't. So when do we need to start telling our stories? We don't do it now. Right now during COVID is a time for us to show that actually, no, we are a people of agency. We are a people that, can, that have taken on COVID and we're challenging it and we're actually winning. So what is our story? You know, I like to think of stories about Africa, rather than positive or negative, just unexpected. They're stories about the continent that you don't expect to see. And some of those things were being challenged, are being challenged by the way people are, what the way artists are, are interpreting the work that they do. So for me, it's really about unexpected Africa. When you can show an image that people think, oh, I didn't realize that was, you know, that could happen in, in Africa. And then in terms of who, you know, I look at storytellers. So storytellers to me are filmmakers. They're the artists. They're content creators, creators like Ali. They're comedians, people who are using their art, their skill, their talent to show a different side of the continent because it's important that we are, as Africans, tell the stories. My favorite quote, which I think sums us all up, is until lions learn to write, hunters will tell their stories for, for them. And that's exactly what has been happening. People have been telling our story for us. And in terms of the where, you, you know, it's important that when we tell our stories, that our stories occupy the right spaces. And I'm just going to give an example. And you can't quote me on this fact, but I think it's true. On Wikipedia, there is more about Paris, the city, than there is on the entire continent of Africa on Wikipedia. And the reason why that's important is that Wikipedia is one of the free and largest sources of knowledge and information that people go to. And if there's nothing on there about Africa, 
there's, that we're not going to be increasing knowledge. So it's important that not only are we putting our content out there, but it's occupying the spaces where the global audiences are looking and where we as Africans are also looking. So that's the, um, the, the why, the when, the what, the who, and the where. Let's go to the next slide just very quickly. I don't want to come out of this looking as if it's all been gloom and doom. So this is the composite of one area where I think that Africa has, has got a good narrative. We've got the best sunsets, <laughs> it seems, in the world. We've got wildlife. We've got, to a certain extent, tourism probably been one of the areas that's really done a lot for the continent. So um, let's quickly just move to the next slide. Um, thank you so much, uh, Moki, for that very powerful uh, yes, presentation. And yes, we'll just uh, dive into the panel discussion now, and we are going to uh, discuss more on um, this topic as well. So um, this time uh, we are running behind um, schedule. Uh, we had some technical glitches in the beginning, but we're here and now um, let's go into the panel discussion. And on, the, on our panel, as I mentioned earlier, we have, uh, we, we have uh, Kim, we have Ali, we have Moki, and we have Marina. And so just to go back, I'll start with um, Moki, uh, probably because Moki is the executive director of Africa No Filter. And your organization focuses on uh, shifting the African uh, narrative. So mm -hmm. um, I know you've just uh, previously shared um, on 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 this uh, on this topic as on building narrative. So then to you, Moki, uh, what does a new narrative for Africa mean to you? I know you had mentioned today. Okay, I mean the narrative has always been there. So what is a new narrative for Africa um, to you? What does that mean to you? Well, I think it's more about us realizing that there isn't a single narrative about Africa. There's a multiplicity of narratives, and that's what we want to get to, so that when people think of Africa, they don't think of these, you know, lack of agency, they're dependent, they're broken. They actually think, well, actually, it's a place of innovation, it's creativity. So for me, that's where we want to go towards more, not that we want to be just that, because to be honest, you have to understand that there is still conflict. I mean, look what's happening in Zimbabwe. Stuff happening in Malawi, in Mali. We can't turn away from it. We're saying that there's, there are 54 different countries. They're all at different levels. They're all doing different things. So there are multiple, multiple narratives. The one thing I would look to say if I wanted to say, let's you know, have a new narrative, let's stop thinking of Africa as one monolithic entity. It is not a country. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Moki, for that. And um, talking about Africa not being uh, one country, um, it could be even on a global, it could be um, what is called a global mindset, you know, having these outdated views on Africa, it being a country or, or, may, or various outdated views. And I'll just drive this question to Kim. Um, so Kim, as I'll say, nowadays shifting the global mindset from outdated views of Africa to something that more closely mirrors uh, Africans' reality is one of the key topics across the African continent. But it, has always, it, it wasn't always like that. Um, for you, Kim, do you remember the first time you thought about reframing narrative as an artist? It's hard for me to say, but um, I would sort of pinpoint it to my move to South Africa. I'd, I was born and grew up in Botswana. And um, as I'd expressed through uh, speaking to my work, I think it was that um, aspect of movement that made me rethink um, the ways in which I had been like brought up to understand myself and how uh, coming into a new context, a new context, sorry, introduced a new way for me to understand myself. It's hard for me to say though whether it is related to my move to South Africa or otherwise um, me starting at university level where um, obviously we began um, critically engaging these sorts of conversations around identity in a particular way at the University of Cape Town, um, particularly with respect to student protests that had outbroke, uh, had outbreak in, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> during the time, um, like with respect to uh, decoloniality and decolonial education. And so I think it was around that time, around my first year at UCT, when I just moved to South Africa 2015, when I started to rethink a lot of the narrative that we just accepted um, based on historical agenda setting. Um, thank you so much, Kim. Um, so from what you're just saying, um, so the narrative um, about Africa could be on different levels, really. 
And um, so now this, this drives me to the question to uh, Marina, who is the senior program uh, manager for the World Bank Art Program. So uh, Marina, on a, what can be done on a micro and macro level to change the narrative about Africa? Um, yes, I'm happy to join. Uh, um, apologies, I have my child with me. Uh, what can be done? Well, essentially, exactly what Moki and um, Kim and Ali were saying. We need to send different images of uh, of the continent. Um, first of all, opening the box is not uh, one country, and uh, multiple countries, uh, each of them with uh, a specific history and a specific narrative. To, to present, but as well, there is an incredible richness of creativity, exactly as uh, Moki will say, that we can tap into, I mean, internationally, globally. It could become uh, really the treasure trove of the world in terms of contemporary art, and, and for art, I mean, all the forms of art. So for example, this exhibition, the other one we did in 2008, um, Africa Now, had uh, um, a very important impact both on the life of specific artists whose career really took off in 2008, uh, just to be exposed in this different way, but as well opening the eyes for many curators around the world and specifically in the United States who started to see a contemporary art from Africa with a different lenses. Now, I can see that auction houses, for example, started to present contemporary art from Africa. Many of them have taken uh, the, if you want, the, the seed, uh, the seed was planted when we started the 2008 exhibition or when, when it was Africa Remix, uh, when there were other projects of this kind that were challenging certain stereotypes. So I would say when you bring different actors together who present a new narrative, then you start to uh, modify the, the way of people look at things. Uh, it's a question of, if you allow me the oversimplification of marketing. And you can do marketing about your own country or your own continent in a different light. I think I'm an Italian, so I have to say, my country is beautiful, but we're not very good at marketing it. Other countries don't have the richness that the African continent of Italy have, but they are very good in presenting themselves. So we need to learn. And I'm, I'm talking, coming from a country that's not very good in doing that at the moment. So I hope this answered your question. Yes, um, thank you so much, uh, Marina. I'm talking about uh, different actors and you know the power of marketing to change the narrative um, about Africa. Uh, this will not um, drive me to Ali, who's um, I believe who's already doing that. He's marketing uh, Zanzibar and other young person um, in tourism. He's also an actor on that scene. So then, uh, Ali, over to you. What role do you think young Africans in tourism? like yourself, can play to build on Africa's you know, uh, narrative? Is Ali still connected? I'm, uh, I'm connected. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I don't know if you got my question. Did you get the question? Yeah, I, yes. I did get your question, yes. 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 So uh, I think, uh, I so I would say that, you know, I or anyone else, we can not choose what happens to us in terms of where I come from, where I'm born, but I can choose how I feel about it. Because for me, I can look at my own country or as Africa as an opportunity, or I can also look at Africa as a challenge. And I think that's the point of uh, understanding the impact we want to create. Because if I explain in the context of, uh, of my own country, which the numbers would go directly in many parts of Africa, that the whole of Tanzania has about 58 million people, a bit more than that. And 67% uh, of the entire population are under the age of 26. And for me, looking at it, that the change needs to be made. Like if you want any, for anything to be uh, to change in this aspect, like this 67% are the people who need to create that change. And even if we, we wish to see things happening, but if we are in the position to create uh, that uh, mindset of uh, how it can change in terms of, of what it's performed and how it is, and I think that role is something uh, very, very important. So understanding the cause is very important and knowing that the cause is greater than ourselves. And that would lead us to a point of, uh, of, creating, uh, of, uh, of creating a greater and uh, a better narrative and telling the stories our own stories and our young people to play a significant role into explaining uh, the story of their own uh, of their own places. 
Thank you so much, Ali. You are definitely doing exactly just that. And um, today being a World um, being Heritage Day, rather, in South Africa, um, Kim, yeah. who, who's character in South Africa, what do you think, um, or rather, what makes you excited about Africa as a cultural um, or heritage tourism destination? Um, I like the way that Moki uh, said it in your presentation where you said um, unexpected Africa, um, speaking to the creators on the continent, and I think Ali mentioned it as well with you know, a focus on young creators on the continent. Um, I am also particularly interested in storytellers and thinking specifically about how we tell stories um, specifically on the continent. I think that there are a lot of untold stories uh, or stories that aren't as easily accessible as, say, those that are popularized um, in the Western sphere. Um, and so I'm quite excited to sort of tap into those untold or rather unpopular um, stories. And I think that they should be popularized. There's so much potential on the continent. And I'm just excited uh, to see us creating these new narratives for ourselves. Thank you so much, Kim. And yes, I do agree with you. There's so much potential on the continent. And um, to the audience, if you have any questions, please uh, just type them in the chat box and uh, we'll, they'll be answered shortly as we go into the Q&A session. I wish we could continue the conversation, but we are running out of time and we cannot end the conversation without uh, talking about uh, COVID-19. As we know, the pandemic has halted tourism worldwide and uh, Marina, in our opening remarks, had touched on that. So apart from the significant challenges it poses, um, I, would, I would direct this to Marina and Moki and Ali, if you could just talk uh, briefly on it. Um, apart from the significant uh, challenges um, the pandemic poses, um, do you think it also provides Africa with new opportunities regarding tourism, maybe shifting the focus to um, domestic and regional markets? You have one minute oh. each to probably talk about this. Thank you. Let me let me just start quickly because one of the things that I think COVID has taught us, the unintended consequence, is um, is technology, adoption of technology. You know, we've been able to travel the world. You know, look how many countries are represented on this call. We've been able to travel the world, sitting right where we are, and I think we can translate that to tourism. You don't physically always have to go there. Some of the videos, Ali, you are creating are exactly the kind of things that people should be seeing because at some point you experience that, that country and then you want to go there. So I think we should use that ability and that, that fact that now people are just much more comfortable doing things digitally to sort of build expectance, um, you know, anticipation for going to Africa. So that's my contribution. Um, I, 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 I think I'll, I can uh, I can jump into that as well uh, in uh, in terms of that I think the the pandemic also has uh, has is also this this pandemic is also an opportunity for for us to rethink what uh, we want to showcase um, as well because uh, it's the time that uh, showed that for example if a country our country was closed and most of the people or people who are creating are people who are not from here are creating the content for people to see what the country is all about and um, creating uh, at that time seeing that people are watching and they want to understand it's also a point of us to uh, to rethink of uh, what do we want to share with the world i mean uh, especially during this time as well and uh, having a look uh, at the same kind of, uh, of concept, I mean, with domestic tourism and seeing that, I mean, we need to encourage also those people, locals to travel their own country. Because for them, seeing, like I make videos and you see people who are locals who don't even know the places that you are making the videos from. And I think this is something very important that this, the rethinking of, uh, of the tourism uh, in general, in terms of how uh, and why, uh, what we want to portray to, to portray to the world. Uh, thank you, um, Mark and Ali, um, wonderful answers. I wanted to add as well that I totally agree with uh, both of you are saying, uh, the power of the, the digital economy is definitely one of the roads to recovery, probably the strongest one. And Africa is definitely on the forefront in many aspects, is much more advanced than the United States, for example, although nobody's telling this story, exactly as was mentioned before. So for example, uh, for the next artist talk of next month, we will address 
uh, digital economy and the power of community participation will address uh, the view on the challenges of creating a new world after COVID. And we will have uh, other artists as well showing how they can uh, influence their community and uh, uh, leverage the digital economy to help uh, um, people who have lost their jobs when uh, the physical tourism disappears. And I totally agree with you, uh, is the time to create a new way in, from inside out about what people are supposed to see. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for your great um, insights. Uh, it was a very powerful discussion and very insightful. I will now get into the Q&A session and uh, because of time, we're able to take a lot of questions, but uh, we will take a few. And um, please stay with us and the, pan the panelists are still, um, the panelists are rather still here and they will take the questions. Um, so there's one question that reads, um, fortunately there's no name, but I'll just read it out. How can we change, uh, this is a question to Moki and Kim, how can we change the idea of tourism from conception-based experience to journey, to journey where the cultural immersion is central and how do we involve the youth and African diaspora? So maybe Moki can start and Kim. Uh, I'm just looking at the question, how can we change the idea of tourism from consumption-based experience to journey? Well, I'm not really sure what the what the um the question means, but you know, like right now, I think tourism, I think we've we've expressed, is is a way into understanding how we as Africans live. And I the way I see this question is that if it's just consumption, you come in and you just want sunsets and you want like, you know, beach and you know, sun, you're not really understanding where you are. Whereas I think that sort of, if it's cultural immersion, where you go in and you actually see how people live, that's real tourism. When you experience and see how people live, we would love more like that because then people understand us. And just really quickly, a lot of young, you know, um, a lot of people have actually said to me, I didn't know I was poor when I was growing up because the way people live today is not, like the way Americans live or Westerns live is not the only way to live. The point is that we've just been taken over by television and we see this all the time. So we've now begun to think that there is only way, one middle class, there is only one way of living, there's so definition of poverty. So when you do tourism that is about culturally immersing yourself in another country, the way they live, the way they do things, you get a better understanding of the country so that all of these narratives that I'm talking about don't exist anymore because now you understand why Tanzania is like it is, you know, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Moki. Kim, do you have any comments on that question? No, I don't quite have anything to add. I think I'd agree with how Moki put it. I think just to echo, I think what Ali has already mentioned because I'm quite interested in the way that he is presenting his knowledge of Zanzibar from like a local perspective. Uh, and so you need to raise the volume. Kim, sorry, it's Marina. You need to raise your volume. We can barely hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Um, I suppose I would just, I, I think it starts at a personal level to an extent. Um, at, to some extent, it is important when you are traveling to just have that focus that, you know what, actually I want to learn something um, and really engage within the cultural um, scene there and take the effort to unpack the things you thought and um, immerse yourself in what the reality is. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kim. We'll just take one last one, and this is to Moki again. Um, so the question is, what should we do with someone like Bill Gates, who despite supporting many development programs in Africa, was so quick to come out saying Corona would devastate Africa. People like him, whose words carry so much weight and travel so far, but who continue to promote a very negative image and narrative of Africa. What should we do about them? Moki. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, look, Bill and you know Bill Gates and everybody else, they have, they're entitled to their opinions and their views. And yeah, the problem is that they, they have you know huge influence. But the reality is that those narratives that I talked about, you know, that Africa is broken, Africa lacks agency, you know, Africans are dependent, are the reason why we have to try and change them because it means that 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 people actually act on them. You know, Bill Gates, their um, foundation spends about five billion, billion US dollars trying to help this continent because he fundamentally believes that we are dependent, we need help, that somehow 
we are broken. And yes, there is a role for philanthropic money. There's a role for um, development um, money. There's a role for, for, for aid. But the thing is, it's, to me, it's about partnership. It's about partnering with the continent. It's not about Africa being the beneficiary. And I think that's the flip that a lot of organizations are trying to get to now, that that's an old style thinking that we need to help Africa, you know, maybe is not there. And for me, COVID has been an ideal moment for us because exactly what Bill said, that we were going to be decimated as a continent, it has not happened. Even Bill Gates can be wrong. Uh, thank you so much, Moki. And this closes the uh, this this closes our Q and A session. And I would now like to invite um, Marina, um, who's going to just give us our closing remarks. And for me, Mr. Moderator, um, I would say goodbye, and I give the floor to Marina. Thank you so much for joining us, and to the panelists. Thank you so much once again, Marina. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, if I may say, the fact that I have my little one in my arms. Uh, speaks exactly we are all under the same sky and dealing with COVID. And a chapeau to all the countries on the African continent who managed to uh, deal with COVID much better, for example, than my country, Italy, at least at the beginning. So uh, my closing remarks are, uh, yes, we can create a new narrative. Um, last month we were talking about gender-based violence. And uh, the, the question was, okay, we have been discussing this over and over. Nothing is changing. There is still a um, high incidence of that. And the, the, our colleague, the expert on JWD, explained to us uh, it takes really a unified approach from many different angles. And art and narrative play an incredibly strong role because they change the way we see the world. So everything that we can do with art exhibition, with the videos, uh, with the specific artworks, um, with all the initiatives that Moki is putting in place, with each of us sharing a different story about Africa or about a specific part of Africa or a specific country in Africa will uh, help. So I thank you all for participating. This is a wonderful opportunity uh, to discuss a very important topic. Next month, as I said, we will uh, link it um, with the road to recovery. Um, we are very lucky to have here Ravne Shans among the participants who will be one of the artists presenting in October. So I hope you will all join us. Uh, if you are already part of the mailing list, you don't need to do anything. If you want to be part of the mailing list, send an email to artprogram at worldbank.org and we'll be delighted to invite you. Thank you all and thank you especially to the panelists and our wonderful moderator. Goodbye. Goodbye, thank you so much. Thank you everyone and goodbye. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Bye.